You're about to join Niels Kostrup Larsen on a raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Rob Carver and I, Niels Castro Larsen, where each week we take the pulse of the global markets through the lens of a rules-based investor. If you're new to the show, I hope that today's episode will trigger your curiosity enough to check out the back catalogue and listen to past episodes that you may have missed, like my conversation with Alan last week, where we discussed how to approach asset allocation when adding trend following to your portfolio, how to find the optimal allocation, and why trend following is often the most consistent part of the portfolio, a topic that we may return to today. Also, if you missed our Wednesday episode, I really would encourage you to listen to the conversation uh, with William White, economist, policy advisor, and policymaker, who worked at the OECD, the BIS, Bank of Canada, and who is perhaps best known for warning the central banks about their failed policies after the great financial crisis. This was a really important conversation on monetary policy and how it can negatively impact the economy. So I would really encourage you to go and check out these episodes if you missed them this week, but of course not until you finished listening to Rob and I today. Rob, Always a pleasure to be back with you. How are things with you? How uh, how's the UK government? Is it still there? Or uh, last time I checked, but I, I haven't looked at the you know the internet for about thirty five minutes. So prime minister could be different now. You never know. Uh, yeah, it's kind of it feels like we've gone from summer to winter in in about a week here. We've gone from kind of way above average temperatures to kind of wet and cold sort of normal weather for this time of year. So um, so yeah, I'm I'm, I'm you, you, the viewers can't see this, but Niels can. I'm, I'm all bundled up in my in my ski jacket and keeping nice and warm and toasty in this seasonally cold weather. You are indeed, actually. I mean, it is, of course, I mean, we say it a little bit like jokingly, but I mean, I think this year it really has mattered. Um, the fact that we had a very mild uh, October, it helped a lot of people save a lot of money, which is, uh, of course, uh, great. So let's, let's hope it doesn't get too cold, uh, although we obviously have no idea um, if that's going to happen. By the way, just set my curiosity a little bit um, kind of um, uh, at ease. Um, you, know that, you know that thing that they did in the UK, whether list trust would last longer than a, 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 um, a bowl of letters or something like that? Yeah. Who, who, who did the letters win? The lettuce one. There we are. Now I can relax and enjoy the rest of my uh, weekend. It's it's, I'm glad. I'm glad, Niels. I'm very glad. Okay. Well, of course, it was another, uh, you know, eventful week. Let's put it that way. Um, Chairman Powell made it pretty clear in his Wednesday press conference that the ultimate level of interest rates will be higher than previously expected. And for longer, too, the futures markets now sees Fed funds staying above 5% for all of 2023. That's a big change, uh, as recently in, as in September, the market expected Fed funds to U-turn lower before it got to even 4%. Now it's reasonable to think it's going over 5 and staying there. But maybe it was also the week where we learned that the stock market might be fine with that. Although, to think that the market can also shake off disappointing tech earnings, as many analysts expect the tech wreck of 2022 to be transitory, much like inflation was supposed to be, may prove costly. But let's go back to the beginning. It all started when the Fed well-publicized leak hinting that the central bank would raise the Fed funds rate by 75 basis points this week. But that another hike of equal magnitude in December meet in the December meeting was not as certain proved at least to be partially correct. The committee did raise by 75 basis points and with it offered a new sentence to the statement, quoting, in determining the pace of future increases in the target range, the committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy. Perhaps this was a written acknowledgement that the committee realizes that they have already tightened aggressively and importantly, policy change works with a lag. However, Chairman Powell's tone 30 minutes later at the post-meeting press conference was decidedly hawkish. Bond traders immediately took rates higher. May, 20, uh, May 2023 Fed funds futures rallied uh, to 4.805% on the day of the leak, 
but have since reversed and are closing out the week at 5.12%. Similarly, the two-year note, uh, which traded below, uh, which... Let me try that again. Similarly, the two-year note, which traded down to recent low at 4.3%, re- reversed violently and finished the week at roughly 4.71%, which is the high of the year. Perhaps Powell has been um, handed an advanced copy of the Friday morning's employment report as he was headed down the hall to the press conference because it showed no sign of moderate, of a moderating economy. The report showed 233,000 jobs were added to the economy, outpacing the 200,000 that was expected. Hourly earnings also rose last month, uh, month, which is certainly a worry for the Fed, especially since the most overlooked JOLS survey of unfilled job openings unexpectedly jumped by 1 million, rising to 10.7 million unfilled jobs. Granting, Granted, rising interest rates are crushing the auto and the home sectors, but the robust robust Demand for workers and the rise in wages seems to be more than offsetting that effect. Well, Rob, it's been another eventful period since we last spoke. What's been catching your sort of attention in the world of finance? Yeah, it's just I've got this report that tells me, um, I talked about before, that sort of classifies market movements over different periods, but I'm going to risk in risk adjusted terms to give you an idea of how big they are. And interestingly, over the last seven days, um, if you look at the three markets that lost the most money, um, they're all related to U.S. technology stocks. So I guess that that kind of tells us a little story there. Um, yeah, it's been about six weeks since I've been last been on. Um, so kind of P&L wise, um, kind of had a, a pretty good um, sort of time after I was on actually kind of back end of September, hit a high water mark. Um, and then, you know, lost a bit of money, made a bit of money, kind of been going sideways. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm up, I'm up, um, pretty much at the level I was, um, say back in May. So I've, I've kind of gone sideways, but we've lost up and down since then. So it's very much still a, a very clear picture that the first few months of this year were actually incredible. Uh, and then I've just flatlined ever since, uh, which, you know, I think, uh, as comparing to a long only portfolio is the sort of performance that, that you, you definitely take, I think. Uh, absolutely. So if I look at if I look at my year kind of year to date, just to kind of filter out the noise, really, um, then then it's still a pretty similar picture in in the sense that um, you know obviously I'm up about about twenty six percent I think, um, and my biggest gains are still the markets where I gained a lot in the early part of the year. So obviously that's mainly in energies, but also a bit in FX, and also a bit in bonds. I've actually done well out of being short bonds, which is you know really unusual. Trend following. If you look at the back test, that doesn't happen too often. Um, turning from the rear view mirror to the the front windscreen, if you like. So my current risk is sort of still lowish. Um, it's kind of not got really that high since the beginning of the year. Um, so my my biggest bets are in in bonds and in energies. Um, and I'm I'm short, obviously still short bonds, still long energies. Um, my biggest short. I th- think it's unchanged from last time which is us 20 years um, my biggest long again maybe the same is crude although actually interestingly and this is this is unusual i'm actually short gas so i'm long crude short gas uh, make make of that what you will uh, obviously gas prices um are a lot more volatile and more driven by seasonality than crude because gas is very hard and expensive to store so uh, it's very much driven by what's going on, um, you know, right now. And, and as we were saying earlier, we've had a, certainly in Europe an unseasonably warm time. Uh, I think gas spot prices have actually gone negative, uh, in, certainly in the UK, a few times. And although I, do, I trade Henry Hub gas in the US, I guess the US is probably not that dissimilar a story. So, so that that's sort of interesting, I guess. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's been a, it's been a pretty pretty quiet period and just just a question of sort of sitting on some 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 um, trades that haven't really done very much um and uh, just just kind of you know as, as we do waiting for the the next big move to come and while it doesn't come just preserving capital and that's what the system seems to be doing pretty effectively so no complaints no complaints yeah no it is quite interesting actually um f- first of all a couple of us observation i think a lot of trend follows certainly if i look at the early numbers that came out uh, th- uh at the end of this week for the month of october 
you know, relatively small plus minuses uh, for the industry. But actually, when you look at the underlying market moves that happened during the month of October, uh, there were some pretty sizable moves uh, on all fronts, even, I mean, with equities up 8 or 9%. You had coffee down 20%. Yeah, I mean, you had a, some pretty, pretty sizable moves. So I think I think that actually speaks quite well for uh, for how the industry is handling um, this period. But also, by the way, just speaking of gas, something that um, um, I was just listened to the, the other day, because there's been a lot of talk about why gas prices are down. And as you alluded to, it's been mild, but also we're hearing all, of, all the time that, yeah, European gas uh, um, storage is full. So, you know, great. I'm not so sure people are aware that actually the gas storage only makes up about 20% of the gas the Europe uses during uh, a whole winter. So, yeah, it's great that it's full, but if we can't get gas on an ongoing basis enough, then it's not going to keep everyone uh, everyone warm. So, um, Yeah, I mean, interestingly, actually, on, the, on that subject, um, there was a big controversy because the, the UK closed this rough field um, gas storage facility um, a couple of years ago and obviously that would have been a big help in smoothing out the volatility in in energy prices you know last winter um, and going coming into spring and uh, that's now reopened with I think 20 percent of its original capacity so um, so yeah it you know that it does seem kind of insane that that was closed because it was a classic case of making a short-term saving for a you know, a long, a long, at a long-term cost because it, okay, it's costing a few million pounds a year to keep going, but you know what the hell? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, the potential benefits could be could be huge if energy prices spiked, and of course they did. So uh, that was a very short-sighted decision that looks like it's being reversed now. Another short-sighted decision. Let's uh, let's put it that way. Anyways, uh, in terms of the week as ho- as a whole, uh, it was actually also a pretty wild ride uh, on Wall Street, so to speak. Um, but I do think that actually trend followers made small gains uh, during the week. Um, gains still from the short exposure to fixed income, I would imagine, was pretty good, and also long exposure to energies, just as you said, Rob. I think that's helped. Helped. Well, I think that might, you know, could have been a little bit more challenging. Uh, currencies, uh, although Mexican peso, British pounds, probably um, could have kind of outweighed losses in other uh, in the other currency pairs. Um, if I look at the soft markets uh, from a performance point of view, they look to be pretty soft, uh, so to speak. And uh, the metals, I think probably trend followers would have lost a little bit of there. And grains, um, maybe kind of a more of a mixed picture. But all in all, I suspect the industry made a little bit of money this month. Although yesterday, actually, I think was a down day um, for sure. My own trend barometer finished the week at 44, so that is kind of neutral. Um, and if we just look at the industry numbers, um, beta 50, and this is as of Thursday, so without Friday's down day, as of Thursday, up 34 basis points for November, up 20.36 for the year. SockGen CTA index, up 63 basis points for November, up 27.5 for the year. SockGen trend, up 38 basis points, up 36.36 for the year. And the short-term traders index down 23 basis points, up 12.31% for the year. Comparing that with MSCI down 1.6% so far in November, down 224 for the year. Uh, the World Government Bond Index off to another rocky start, down 68 basis points in November. And the S&P 500 down 2.62% so far this month, down almost 21% for the year, despite a very strong um October, of course. All right, Rob, you brought along some great uh, topics that we want to dive into, but we have quite a few questions as usual uh, when you're on. Um, But before we can go into any of those, I got to ask you, how's the book coming along? Um, The book is is basically done as far as my bit's concerned. So um, I've just finished um, the kind of proofreading of the the final print copy. Um, So that then has to go to the printers, which it's going to take apparently it's going to take a while i guess plan on supply chain issues or something but um so i'm i'm kind of not exactly sitting back and relaxing because i i have some work to do in terms of i i put a together a website for people who are going to buy the book and that's got spreadsheets and python code on so i'm kind of building that side of things uh, but the actual content is is done and uh, the feedback i've had from the people who've been kind of reading it for me and checking the copy and stuff has been pretty positive so i'm i'm very much looking forward to to that coming out um and uh maybe we'll have a, a longer chat about it uh when it comes oh, out. i have a feeling we will maybe not just one but yeah. uh, it'll be fun for sure <laughs> 
Okay, all right. Well, let's get into it. Um, so the first question came from Simon. Um, the question is simply, what is the shortest term that Rob has looked at in trend following slash momentum trading? There are obviously a lot of breakout traders who, uh, who can look for sharp breaks and hold for quite a short period of time. I appreciate the liquidity constraints for very large, for very large funds, but for smaller managers, I imagine there would be some interesting advantages there. For example, the higher trade count, uh, with corresponding smoother equity curve and larger sample size for back tests perhaps this is a style that uh, the intraday futures traders are more focused on given there might be too few opportunities on an end of day basis for stock traders there's obviously quite a large universe to be looking for these kinds of opportunities um in i don't suppose uh, anyone has looked at that there are there is no shortage uh, of interviews with discretionary stock traders looking for these kind of opportunities. However, I'd really love to know what's being done on the systematic slash quantitative side of this space. Thanks so much for any insights and keep up the good work. Love the podcast and wishing you all well from Australia. So, um, interestingly, this is actually something I talk about in my new book. Um, so, there's kind of this stylized fact that trend following works really well for time periods of between about a month and about a year very roughly um if you go beyond that so if you go into multiple years you're looking at some kind of value stroke mean reversion strategy performing best like the classic kind of equity value market neutral strategy um and if you go shorter than that then you start to see the profitability of of you know, trend falling will break down. And in particular, uh, if you look at the kind of momentum crossovers that form the core of my system, um, the faster ones of those aren't as profitable as the ones that have a holding period of at least a month, for example. So I have kind of have this theory that um, diff different different um, effects play out different time periods. So you've got kind of momentum between a month and a year. Beyond a year, you've got mean reversion. Below a month, probably mean reversion works well. And actually, in the book, I do actually backtest a, a mean reversion system with a holding period of a few days. And that does really well, although you have to be really super hot on execution because otherwise the transaction cost will absolutely kill you. And you cannot execute it the same way you can execute a trend following strategy. Uh, and you have to use limit orders effectively to do that. Now, it's quite likely that if you go down an even tighter time frame, so holding periods of maybe a day or a few hours, I would it's quite likely that trends will reassert themselves. So you'd start to see trend following behavior again. Um, and if we go right down to kind of sort of sub second level, then the the kind of trading that market makers, stroke high frequency traders do, is very much mean reversion. They're very much trying to buy at the bid and sell at the offer. So so you know that it kind of makes sense to them in terms of my theory of these different patterns of price behavior at different time periods now so the question is is this this kind of few hour or single or two day momentum period effect is it something that exists and is it something we can capture and there has actually been some work done by by various people um and and the main people who've done quite a lot of this is the um quant team at Sockgen who've looked at this a sort of intraday momentum effect and they found that there is something there and they also have theories that it's related to to things like uh, option dealers hedging and and you know hedging at specific times of the day for example potentially um although you know we, we're generally on on this podcast and certainly i'm not that bothered about where an, you know an explanation for an effect or as long as it's there in the data and it's it's significant enough that's fine um, now, the issue, of course, with as you trade faster and faster, as I've already alluded to with this mean reversion system, is transaction costs. Um, and you cannot use limit orders when you're trading a fast trend following strategy, because if you think about what you're trying to do, you, you basically think that over the next few hours, the price is going to go up. You really want to buy now at this point here, because if you wait, you know, half an hour, well, your expectation is in the next half an hour, the price is going to be increasing. Um, so you, you buy, you, you either got to be set yourself up in a situation where you're missing a lot of trades because you're not getting the execution done and then the, the thing just moves away from you um or alternatively where where you have to cross the spread every time and and, and do that trade at the market level and then you know close out again uh, in a few hours time and transaction cost wise that will absolutely kill you 
um, and even in futures, which is a relatively cheap asset class to trade, uh, there's probably only about maybe a dozen futures that are liquid enough to trade this kind of strategy and, and still survive the transaction costs. Um, and so, you know, and it's not even really to do with size. I mean, you know, my, my account's not that big, but even for me, the, the transaction costs, trading a single contract would just be too too big to overcome. Um, so in conclusion, I would say there is probably something there, um, but it's really difficult to to, to capture uh, to capture that effect. Um, and I'd say it's it's a kind of playground that you should only play in if your execution abilities are absolutely on point and you you know your your, your back testing is, is really super super good. Um, so you can be confident there really is something there that's worth capturing and you need to be really careful about which markets you trade trade in as well. And finally, as as the question says, you know, it, it's probably not something that a you know a five hundred million dollar fund even can do successfully. Um, you need to be much smaller than that. So it is probably has very limited capacity. I, I generally would say for mo- you know ninety nine percent of the people listening to this podcast, which includes me. Don't do it. So that's the short answer. Okay. So let me just try and make sure I fully understand everything you said here. So when you talk about a uh, time frame, um, you were talking about holding periods. I normally think about it as look back periods. Um, so can we translate some of that? The reason I say it is that uh, we actually do some analysis where we take kind of a classical, and I don't m- mean to say necessarily um, in a particular style, but let's just call it a a trend following approach, and um, that I think is pretty universal. And we then go back and we look at that uh, over different look back periods, um, and we go all the way down to about twenty days, and we go all the way up to about three hundred days to see if there is some kind of pattern as to which look back period um, would be more consistent. And we do this more for visualization purposes, not how we trade. But I should I should say. And and what you see on this, if you go back, uh, we go back to year 2000, is that there is a clear gravitation between these annual observations. So essentially, we're looking just to see how is the uh, return based on Sharp distributed across all these um, look back periods for each calendar year. And then we look at, we identify which one was the best, just for illustration purposes. And if you look at which one was the best, I would say, and this is a little bit from memory, but I would say probably of the 22-year observations, I would say about 15 or so probably is um, around the 200-day mark, uh, plus minus, of course, say 25, 30 days. And then you have a couple which were quite short. For example, interestingly enough, 2008, it was 50 days. But all of the time periods were profitable. So it didn't really matter whether you were trading 50 days or whether you were using 200 days. It did not make a difference. It's just that 50 days was the the perfect um, pick. Um, and then you have a few other ones that are probably sort of 75 to 100 days. Anyways, there seems to be a clear gravitation towards longer term time frames in terms of look back period. Um, so I think that's kind of what you're confirming um as well, because 200 trading days is about one year. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, there'll be a relationship between look back period and average holding period for a given type of, of trading rule or time series filter, if you want to get technical. Um, so for the moving average crossovers that I use, um, if I look at, say, um, 16 and 64 days crossover with exponential weighting, um, that will trade roughly, that'll have a holding period about once a year. And the, the 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 sorry, apologies. Once a month. Oh, apologies. once a month. Once okay. a month. Yeah, so I was a little once bit surprised. <laughs> and the look the look back the look back period of that is going to be somewhere between sixteen and sixty four days. So it's going to be about um, probably about fifty day fifty business days, which is about two months. So you're looking at you say for this kind of moving average stuff, a two month look back corresponds roughly to a one month holding period, right? So if I talk about a holding period of you know the the mean reversion system was talking about. That's got a holding period of, of, of you know of about say two maybe three days. The look back for that is about a week, roughly. Um, if we're going right down to this sort of very short time frame, so less than a business day of holding period, you know, then the the, the look back is probably going to be a couple of days. So you look, you know, 
very, very, very lovely, but it's well, 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 you know, it's well beyond the point where you are doing your analysis. It's well beyond the point where I, I trade momentum as well because it's just too damn expensive and because it stops working and then maybe st maybe it stops working, you know, for time periods of less than about a month. It may start working again for time periods that are much shorter than that, but the trading costs are very hard to overcome and I just stay away from it. No, absolutely. But the other thing I wanted to just comment on is that I think when we get down to the shorter term timeframes, I'm not so sure I would call it trend following. And the reason I say that is I don't think you can actually make money if you had to wait for the trend to turn <laughs> to get out. I actually think that the people who do short term trading have other ways of getting out, such as time stops, price stops. Um, your price targets, et cetera, et cetera. So they're just looking for the for the explosion of volatility in a certain direction, and then they get out a, a day later, three days later, whatever. But it's certainly not what I would call trend following. So I just want to sort of throw that out there. But I think you're nodding, so you're probably in agreement with that. Okay, cool. Um, let's move on to a question from Matthew. Uh, Matthew writes, I have a couple of questions for next week. If you think suitable to have, uh, have when Rob is on, of course. To get into the trend following funds within tax wrappers in the UK, and by the way, I will say just up front, we don't do any tax advice or any advice really, but I'll let the question run. Um, to get into the trend following funds within uh, tax wrappers in the UK, the only viable route seems to be the usage funds. However, the target volatility of these funds usually half of compared to the programs available to larger investors. Do you have thoughts on how the allocation to trend following funds in an overall portfolio should shift because of that? And then the second question, for smaller for small investors who want to run their own portfolio, would it be more uh, advisable to start with an equity momentum strategy first, as described, as described by Andreas Klino, in stocks on the move, uh, due to the minimum tradable positions generally being smaller for stocks compared to futures. Even with spread betting, the, um, some minimum positions are too large for small investors. Um, and then he writes, I've got four um, trend-following usage funds at the moment. Two of them appear to be about 10% target volatility and the other two about 15 So mathematically, um, the if you're, you have a lower volatility, then you should allocate more to it. That's just basic portfolio optimization. The, the downside of that, and, and if we, we do talk about allocations to trend following later in the episode, the downside of that, of course, is it may potentially lower your return unless you've got access to leverage. And we're in a world, if you're just trading along in the usage funds, where you, you don't have that. So what that means in practice is, let's suppose that you did some kind of optimization exercise and said, well, I want to put, um, say, a quarter of my money into trend following with a trend following fund running at, say, a 25% annualized vol, which is what I run my own money at. Now, if you can't get that 25 vol fund, instead you can only get access to a fund that's running at 12 and a half, then mathematically, it's very simple. You should increase your allocation from 25% to 50%. And that that's basically the answer to the question. Um, now, whether you're comfortable doing that, of course, and is, is entirely another question. But, but um, you know, it's, it's disappointing because um, it would be nicer in many ways if, if there were, were more usage funds available and they did have higher vol targets it's also more efficient from a fee perspective as well uh, and that's why you know a lot of institutional investors I mean we we used to have a big investor when I was at AHL who used to say to us you know we want 30 vol fund subclass because you know um, that means we don't have to give you such a big allocation to get the same risk level because those guys understood the maths behind that um, and uh, and also we want to discount on the on the fees <laughs> because they were and they're big enough that they could do that. I won't name them. They were big enough that they could do that. So um, so you know, but as a retail investor, obviously you can't. You don't have that kind of negotiating power, sadly. Um, so the the short answer is you you've got to you should put more in really, which is the answer to most questions on this podcast. Yeah, exactly. It's more, enough, more trend following. More trend it's, like, it's like more cowbell, more trend following. Yeah. Before you just quickly comment on the on the equity thing, I just want to say to people that there is a reason why uh, the usage space can't offer 25% vol because in the usage space there is a cap to uh, the value at risk budget we are allowed to use in the funds and so that actually normally means that once you get sort of past 15% vol annualized vol maybe 17 if you know you you run into the risk of running into the cap on VAR uh, on a regular basis uh, so we have some real experience with that which is also why we had to lower 
uh, the um, the leverage we use in 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 our usage fund. So there is unfortunately it's regulation, and 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 I hate to say it, but often regulation actually makes it makes it worse for investors. Um, even though they try and argue that uh, it's they're trying to make it safer for them uh, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean this is this is the classic thing that regulation punishes the good guys. Why, you know, regulators want to punish the bad guys. So, you know, if they didn't have this, there'd be some, you know, nut job advertising a, a 50 vol insane fund that just did something completely crazy and was just designed to eat people's money up. Um, so they have to regulate that. Um, but it's it's quite hard to to regulate and say, well, you can't do bad things. But people say, well, how do you define bad things? And the regulators are like, well, okay, there's a VAR limit. That's nice and simple. Here's how you calculate the VAR. You can't go above this 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 limit, and it's it's obviously very makes the regulator's life easier. It, it makes the industry's life easier as well because the you know very clearly what will or will not meet the regulations. But it it does obviously all regulations, all rules have side effects, and this is one of them. And actually, the same goes for commodities, as far as I understand. The new usage funds, um, certainly in some domiciles, are not allowed to include commodities anymore, uh, which is great for those funds who are still out there with commodities. Um, I can think of one at least. and um, But it is a big problem because uh, commodities are the best diversifiers in a CTA portfolio, frankly. So why would you want to take them away from um, from the investment public? It's, it's, um, it's not quite um, easy to understand. Did you have a quick comment on the other stuff? Yeah. Yeah, let's move on to the thing so um i mean this this there's two parts to this second question really one is is andreas clanel's stocks in the move strategy a good one yes i've, I've read the book it's it's well founded um it's a basically a um a single stock momentum strategy that you also that uses a filter based on the overall momentum in the market so yeah, this, this i quite like that um is is single stock equities a good thing to trade for momentum we've gone over this in the podcast many many times um you know should you do it instead of futures should you do it as well as futures we've we've been around this this course quite a few times um of course in theory if you have enough capital you you wouldn't start with equities because you know you get less diversification within equities than you do across multiple asset classes that you can trade with futures um, having said all that, you know, if you don't have enough money for futures, if you don't want to go down the fun route, then then yeah, it's a reasonable thing to do. Um, it's a reasonable place to start. Uh, I think that's a you know a, a good idea, and Andreas's strategy is a sound one. So why not? All right, cool. Andre, Andreas, uh, if you're listening, uh, I'll have the twenty dollars in the usual place. Thank you. Exactly. I was just going to say that. There we are. Anyways, um, now we have a comment. I don't think Mark, who sent in this comment, meant for us to necessarily have it as a big debate, but I do think that he makes some interesting observations that um, that I would like to comment on. But more importantly, I'd like to hear your comments on it. So, uh, Mark wrote in. Thanks for your podcast. I enjoy them. Very helpful. You and most of your guests are getting asset classes confused with trading strategies. I hear this especially when you discuss adding trend following to a traditional 60-40 model. Academia does not does a poor job separating the two. Let's assume there are five major asset classes, stocks, which can be private or public, real estate, bonds, currencies, which are just a zero duration bond dom- denominated in other currencies, and commodities. Let's as- assume um there are three major investment strategies, trend following, mean reversion, indexing, many sub uh, strategies under each uh, of those categories. Therefore, there are 15 independent asset class slash trading strategy combination. The first step in portfolio design is to decide asset class percentages. The next step is to decide trading strategies. Those are very unique and separate decisions that both lead to different types of diversification. A 60-40 traditional allocation is usually 60% stocks, index uh, strategy and 40% bonds using index strategy. A diversified CTA usually has all asset classes but uh, only uses trend-following strategies. Trying to compare a single asset class index strategy with diversified asset class trend-following strategies is changing two variables, the asset class and the trading strategy. And, and can be confusing. First, you should be talking about adding more asset classes to a 60% uh, stock and 40% bond strategy, adding commodities, real estate, and currencies to have more asset class diversification. Then secondly, you should 
discuss adding trading strategies, diversification, using trend following to manage some or all of those separate asset classes versus other trading strategies. Anyways, it was a comment. Um, but what <laughs> well, do you... yeah, and I'll, I've got some comments to make back. I okay. mean, of course you're correct. Of course he's correct. Um, so, you know, should there be more asset classes added to a 60-40 stock bond strategy? Yeah, of course there should. I mean, I wrote I wrote a book about this. It was called Smart Portfolios. I don't talk about it very much because it's more about investing than training. But absolutely. Um, I, I, ju- I think the reason we talk about 60-40 a lot in the podcast is because it's it's a very simple way of, of describing what investors have in their portfolio apart from trend following. And I bet you there is no one listening to this podcast who has literally has a 60-40 bond equity sorry, equity bond allocation. Um, it's, but we use it as a shorthand term. Um, and, um, you know, I think I think most people understand that. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, should we go on more about adding other things into that long only portfolio? Well, maybe. Um, I mean, I personally have lots of lots of things in my long only portfolio. It's certainly not just 60-40. Um, but I don't think that necessarily falls within the remit of the podcast. Um, similarly, about adding trading strategy diversification. I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm perhaps not unique, but I'm u- unusual in terms of the the people on the podcast. And that I do talk about the other things I have besides momentum. I have carry. I do have some mean reversion. I have various other things in 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 my system. So that's absolutely fine. Just very quickly, return to the first part of the comment, which is about this idea of saying, well. You know, you guys, he's saying, well, you guys are doing the wrong way, right? Because if he's right, so you've got three, let's say you've got three trading strategies of five asset classes, which is 15 combinations. He's saying, well, you you know, you, you guys, um, you know, you're doing it, you should do asset class percentages first and then trading strategy rather than trading strategy and then asset class. So from a theoretical point of view, the best thing to do is actually to do that optimization simultaneously. In other words, to actually allocate all 15 chunks of your portfolio simultaneously. And that will give you, in theory, the best um, outcome. It will certainly give you the highest back-tested return because you've got more degrees of freedom in your optimization. Now, I've done quite a lot of work in this in the past, and it turns out it doesn't really matter if you do it the other if you do it um, in a kind of hierarchical way. In other words, if you do asset classes and then trading strategies or trading strategies and asset classes, it doesn't actually matter that much. It will reduce the um, the, the back-tested. Uh, expect to return a little bit um, because the um, because you've got fewer degrees of freedom. Um, whether it's better in the back test to do trading strategies or first or asset classes first um, depends on the on mainly on the correlation structure of of, of those two things. Um, in practice, it, it, <laughs> it doesn't really doesn't really make much difference. And if you look at outer sample rather than back, you know, in sample back test returns, there's no difference at all. It doesn't really matter which way around you do that. Um, so th- doing it one way or the other, to me, comes down to what, you know, where you're starting from. So if you're starting with someone who has a 64 to portfolio or some of the lonely portfolio that you can't play with and you're adding trending following on, trend following onto that, which is the kind of model of the way that we talk about this subject in the podcast, and it is a shorthand, as I said, um, then, then fine, do it that way. You know, take the long only stuff as exogenous, add in the trading strategy stuff separately. Um, but if you've got complete control of all of those buckets, then by all means, do it the other way around or do them simultaneously. It's not in the grand scheme of things going to make a huge amount of difference. So, um, I, I'm, I'm quite, I quite like the comments, and I kind, kind of agree with them. But I also think that in the long, in the long run, keeping things. In terms of certainly in terms of explaining things on the podcast, there's a reason why we keep things simple and don't start say, well, you know, we'll start with your 250,000 by 250,000 matrix of possible assets you can allocate to, and that's the only way to do it. Uh, we'd be here all day if we started like that. Yeah, and and I completely agree with that. And of course, I have not done any of these tests that you have done, and and so I'm just speaking sort of from my gut feel. And my gut feel is that that actually, if you as a starting point said, yeah, you're going to have some bonds, you're going to have some stocks, but on top of that, what can we, if we can just pick one thing to add to such a portfolio that will really make a difference, it probably is trend following. Of course, a diversified trend following strategy, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's perfectly fine. It's good comment, of course. I think it's perfectly fine and very reasonable for people just to use those three quote unquote um, items um, in, in, in a portfolio uh, and because, as you said, it makes it simple to uh, understand, it makes it simple to implement, and 
you know, who knows if there would be a benefit to try and juggle, you know, five, six different asset classes and, and various trading strategies and what have you. So, but it's a, it's a good point. That's also why I wanted to uh, bring it up. All right, next one is up a uh, question from Toby. Toby writes, you've covered trend following at length in your podcast, and rightly so. It is a robust strategy. I know Rob has spent some time working on mean reversion systems. Could you spend some time explaining your approach by building mean reversion systems apart from carry, which has elements of mean reversion for global macro, meaning it could be applied to bonds, stocks, currencies, and commodities? Have you looked at cross-sectional signals within each macro sector? What are your thoughts, Rob? Uh, yeah, so I have got this this stuff within my um, um, portfolio, and actually, I talk about it in the new book as well. So, the, the basic idea would be, rather than looking at the outright momentum of, say, US ten years, I look at US how US ten years have done relative to the overall kind of bond complex, and if it's done relatively well, I'd be buying it. If it's done relatively badly, I'd be selling it. That's the basic idea. Um, it's not a massively profitable strategy, and the reason for that is that most of the trends within an asset class are actually kind of global across a particular asset class, and I have yet another strategy that picks up on that that actually trades, you know, the whole bond sector and all the whole, you know, commodity sector as a single market effectively. Um, so by, by, re- by looking at the cross-sectional effects, you're effectively removing that and you're left with the residual, and the residual is quite weak. So... I'd say, I can't remember the exact figures, but I'd say roughly 75% of the performance of, of trend following seems to come at an asset class level, and only about 20% comes kind of within the asset class level. So it's a nice little thing to add to a, to a system, but it doesn't give you a huge amount of extra value. All right, cool. Question from Zach. Um, Zach writes, in chapter 12, speed and size of systematic trading, it is noted to ignore holding costs uh, of certain instruments when calculating the standardized cost in SR terms. By the way, SR, is that sharp ratio when you write about this? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Holding cost for futures is noted as the required rolling from contract to contract. If somebody has to trade the mini or micro contracts to achieve a position, um, should one still ignore those rolling costs or should they be f- uh, factored into the sharp ratio calculation? Or if Rob needs a question to promote uh, or discuss his new book, it's funny he should mention that, will Rob's new book include a section of standardizing trading cost calculations when trading micro futures contracts? Yeah, I'll be honest. I, I really hate it when people ask me about stuff from my books, especially systematic trading, which I wrote in 2015. That's, that's now seven years ago. So. <laughs> um, I can't remember why I said to ignore holding costs in certain instruments. Maybe because I, in in a lot of futures, they're they're pretty minimal. To be honest, they don't have a huge amount of a, an effect. But no, strictly speaking, you should include rolling costs in in your calculations. And if if it's something that's traded monthly, then that that definitely should be true. Um, and obviously, the the slower you're trading, um, so if you're trading in a quite a slow trend following system, then holding costs will form a, la- a larger and larger proportion of your overall trading cost profile. So they are important. Um, the, the question of whether to trade, you know, the micros, the minis, or the full size contracts um, is something that is in the new book as it happens. Um, and uh, you know, the, I, I would certainly, you know, it's certainly the case that for a lot of the the, the smaller contracts, not all of them, some some it's pretty competitive but for some of them because they're not li- quite liquid enough um those interest rate um contracts that, that zach's talking about i don't actually trade those because i don't meet my liquidity requirements so um, i do stick to the the bigger contracts um so um so yeah it's you know i i do trading costs is is one of my bugbears that people don't spend enough time thinking about it and it, it's definitely worth doing doing a proper analysis of what the trading costs are of a given instrument before you decide to trade it so um, definitely along the right, right lines there. And it's good to hear from someone who's such an avid reader of my stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, last question. And then we move on to your um, very interesting topics. Uh, it's a question from um, Anise, I think uh, it's pronounced. Hi there. Firstly, I love the show. Thank you for all the advice, insights you and your guests share. A quick background on myself. I'm an individual trader and I trade my own account. I trade cash equities and I have no experience with futures. I'm starting to dip my feet into longer-term trend following. My question relates to using cash equities versus futures for trend following. I notice that most commodities slash FX ETFs have very low liquidity, making it harder to incorporate when uh, them into a system. Excluding them would mean I lose market diversification. Do you think investing time in learning futures is worth it, or should I stick to 
the available liquid ETFs. Thanks very much. All right. It's that question again, isn't it? Equities or futures or ETFs or futures. Um, so, I mean, there are there are pros and cons to trading ETFs um, instead of futures. So um, liquidity is an issue potentially. Also, there can be quite expensive in terms of holding costs. You know, the, the, the uh, AERs get charged. Um, there can be issues with things like if they're um, leveraged, you know, the two or the three times leveraged. Um, there can be issues if you're using, if you're buying the short versions of them to proxy for a proper short sale. Um, and um, just trying to think, there's, there's something, oh yeah, so in, in commodities specifically, um, there can be issues in the way that they're actually hedging their exposure and they're proxying uh, the, 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 the futures contracts. So it's not so much of an issue now, but if you go back a few years, there was a very large oil ETF that was holding the front contract um, and was getting absolutely burned every time they rolled uh, that contract. Um, and um, now they, they've they moved out a bit further into the, the curve, so it's slightly less of an issue. But there are a lot of things you need to think about. Is it worth learning how to trade futures? I mean, it depends on on how much capital you have and how much time you're willing to devote to it. Um, uh, if you know if you're trading a reasonable size portfolio, then you should probably start thinking about and, you, and you're kind of reasonably experienced and you know your stuff because you know ultimately futures are a leveraged derivative, so you know they're automatically a lot riskier than a than a cash instrument. Um, and um, that's one reason why regulators, <laughs> going back to regulators, wisely make you know tell brokers to make sure that people know what they're doing when they're trading them, and why we have things like margin and so on and so forth to protect us. Um, so if you feel you fall into that category and you have a decent sized amount of capital, then from a purely theoretical perspective, you will always probably do better with futures because there's yeah there's more things you can trade, um, and you you don't have to worry about a lot of the issues of the ETFs that I've discussed, and they're generally cheaper as well. So um, yeah, no, yeah. I think that's sound advice actually. Very very good. All right. Well, first of all, thanks very much for all the questions that came in for Rob. That's fantastic. That's great. We appreciate it. Now we're going to jump on to some of the topics that you brought along, Rob. Um, and um, the, the first one, I think, um, you know, obviously it's something we've been discussing a little bit, uh, certainly when it comes to CTA replication. You called it hedge fund replication, so maybe it's a little bit broader as a topic. So, uh, But I do think it's valuable to uh, discuss. It's something that there's a lot of... Um, <laughs> time on twitter being spent uh, on right now so where, where are you gonna where where are we going with the hedge fund replication from your point of view yeah it's it's an it's a topic i found very interesting because um i actually used to work with a guy who wrote one of the original um academic papers on on um on hedge fund replication um and um I, you know, we, we, um, he's a great guy and really good, but I was always very skeptical about the methodology that was used. Um, so I, I just thought it'd be worth kind of, um, cause, cause I think you on a podcast a couple of weeks ago or three weeks ago, I can't remember now, but you, you had somebody who was describing a particular, Andrew Beer. yeah, Andrew was doing it. He's got this very interesting way of doing replication. Um, and, uh, my understanding is that what he basically does is, is do some kind of, um, regression of recent returns to determine which instruments he should be holding that will replicate the, you know, the ideal sort of hedge fund, port, you know, and it, I say hedge fund cause it is wide in the CTA universe. In fact, in theory, you could pump any, any returns of anything at an index, you know, you could try and, for example, replicate the returns of, I don't know, Renaissance potentially, um by by using this sort of methodology um so i just thought it was worth talking about a few different ways of doing this um because it's a topic i i think is really interesting and um i i I think um i don't think we've ever talked about it much detail on the podcast before so I, i thought i'd just bring my what little knowledge and experience i have of the topic to the table uh as it seems to be a current one um so the 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 way that that Andrew's doing it is 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 one way of doing things, and and um, you know that the, there are potentially problems with this. So, obvious one is obviously a lag. So, um, any kind of regression that you're doing is is going to suffer from the fact that positions are always changing, right? And the um, you know the the positions that a fund has on today will maybe very different positions they had on three months ago or six months ago, um, and um, 
the, the you know the, the the sort of it comes back to this thing we talked about already, which is a question of how long should your look back window be right? If your look back window is is too short, you're going to have a real signal to noise problem and really struggle to work out um, you know what the correct set of positions are because you'll just have a very noisy regression. If your look back window is too long, on the other hand. Um, then you're you're going to struggle um, to keep up with the way that the underlying fund or funds are, are changing their returns. Um, so that that's potentially an issue. Um, the, the the other the, the, there are other ways of doing it though. So um, and one po person pointed out to me that um, you can actually get access to the underlying positions of many funds, um, and uh, it with, admittedly with a lag, of course. Um, if you can do that, um, then you can, well, obviously you could just copy them, right? I mean, that that's a simple way of doing it. But you can do more sophisticated things, which is actually try and, again, using a statistical technique, sort of try and work out a model for the, how their positions are adjusting. Um, and then try and do what's called a now cast. So you're, you're trying to forecast what's happening now. So you try and forecast where the positions are now, which is information you might not get for a day or a week or a month, depending on, on the reporting requirements. That, that's another way of doing it. The, the way I actually do my own trading is actually this dynamic optimization talked about before. is, is sort of like that in a sense, because I effectively have a series of positions that an imaginary large hedge fund is holding. And then I say, well, how can I closely match that? Um, so it's, it's in some ways the technique's not that dissimilar. Um, and the third way of doing it, which I personally think is probably simpler than, <laughs> than all this other stuff, is actually just to build your own little trend following model. Um, and, um, and and just so what you do is you you, you, you you sort of say, well, I've got a series of assets I can allocate to. And, there's, and this kind of goes back to the earlier question about, about allocation. So you might have, say, 25 or 30 or 50 liquid futures markets, and you might have half a dozen different systems that strategies that trade those um and then then you you start with that and then what you do is say well how what's the best um, um combination of those assets that most closely matches the index that i'm trying to replicate uh, and that to me probably makes more sense to be honest um, and we actually used to do this with our um with our competitors when i was working for uh, ahl we actually had a winton model we had a, an aspect model. We had a Campbell model, and we were trying. We and I don't know whether they still do this. Obviously, this is many years ago now. But we would try and try and work out what their allocations were to say fast versus slow trend following versus carry. You know what they had in bonds, equities, and so on and so forth. And that would give us some color as to when there were big differences in our performance, where that might be coming from. It could just be that they were better than us, or we were worse than them. But it could also be just a relatively short term thing, and it was kind of useful context even if we didn't do anything with it in the end um so yeah that that's just to kind of give people a, a view of the the different ways of doing this and there are other ways of doing it as well and the in fact the original work done by my ex-colleague um was a was a m very much more statistical technique which basically tried to match the distribution of returns um of some index or some strategy some fund um and basically you could literally pump anything into that i mean and um one of the criticisms of that was they they chose an asset that had a really high sharp ratio and and basically if you have an asset that's a really high sharp ratio you can do things like pump it through a particular kind of filter and turn it into an asset that has a slightly lower chart ratio but a very high positive skew which of course would make it look like a trend following strategy you can do stuff like that uh, but it does rely on having an asset with a very high chart ratio to begin with which um you know is is, is a bit of an in sample fitting issue potentially so so there we go actually very interesting first of all super interesting that you were um first of all that you are kind of a little bit of a replicator you can put that on your business card as well because of course you and i actually spoke quite a lot about your dynamic uh, portfolio optimization and it actually makes perfect sense and now that you explain it that it's kind of replicating um, um you know s similar to what uh, what uh, these replicator funds uh, are doing also of course very interesting to hear that even people like ahl at least at that time would spend any time trying to figure out what the competitors were doing i know for sure we're not spending any time finding out what competitors are doing but let me pose a couple of questions to you from my conversations and interactions with andrew um you know as i've said uh, before i like what they do in the sense that i think it 
helps bring trend following into more portfolios. So the, the success they're having, great for them, probably great for the industry, as long as they don't screw it up, to be frank, because if they did, it's not going to be great. Um, so the pressure is on, on Andrew on that part. part. However, Andrew is quick to point out that um, that one of the things that was part of the reason why they ended up doing this was that they would often meet investors saying, talking about single manager risk and how could you pick a manager because next year he might be the worst even though he was the best the year before and so on and so forth. And, and that, of, of course, is true. But I also think it would be then equally true to say, well, couldn't there be a single replicator risk? What if their model goes wrong because they're only using one, I mean, I'm simplifying it, they may be used, but they're only using kind of one approach and it could get it, it could go wrong, frankly. So I think we can't, we can't, we can't say that these replicator uh, products have less risk. They just have a different set of risks, in my opinion. Um, and of course, my own view would be to say, why don't you just get three or four different trend followers by them, put, you know, with, with people with long experience, and I think you would be absolutely fine and you don't have to worry about single manager risk and all of that stuff. So that's probably where I'm still sitting. Um, because the other thing I thought of was with these replicator funds, and certainly the way Andrew explained his approach on the podcast a few weeks ago, is of course that he looks to replicate um, about 20 managers combined return stream, managers who combine trade hundreds of markets, right? But he's doing it through 14 different markets. Yeah, and there's, so, a, re there's a reason for that as well. Yeah, so, and, uh, hey, just, feel free to comment on that. If I can just ask you the question. So the the, the question for me is, or the... the um, um, the counterintuitive uh, nature of that for me is that here we sit every week and we preach diversification of models, diversification of markets, timeframes, etc. And then you stick it into one model and you stick it into only 14 markets. It's kind of doing exactly the opposite of diversification, in my opinion. And I can't articulate, I'm not you know, it's above my pay grade to see specifically where those risks may lie. But Based, just based on my experience, it sounds more risky um, somewhere in that process. Um, you know, that's just how I see it. Yeah, so the, re the reason why there's a small number of markets is this kind of replication strategy. You can't do that with a large number of markets because essentially, intuitively, there's not enough information in the series of returns you've got to tell you what position you should have in 50 or 100 or 150 markets. You can only trade a small number of markets. And the other... The other problem is that they have to be the same markets, right? So the one of the interesting things about my dynamic optimization um, strategy is, I, in theory, I've got 150 markets I can trade. Actually, I think I'm up to 200 markets now, but maybe 50 aren't in liquid enough. Um, and the so although although I may I probably have about the same number of positions on as a CTF, in fact, maybe even fewer now. I think I've got 10 positions on. Those 10 positions will change over time. You know, so today I'm short US 20 here. <laughs> That's where my kind of bond exposure is coming from. Well, tomorrow it could be mini JGBs. It could be something else. You just don't know. Um, so, um, so that the, you know, the that that means. So, if I was to run my dynamic optimization strategy, and I, I, and I'm not sure if I've done this explicit experiment, but it'd be interesting, and to say, well, I'm only going to pick, say, 14 markets and stick to those to do exactly the same as I'm doing now, but instead of allowing myself to take a position in any of 150 markets, I only allow myself to take a position in just 14. I know for a fact that the correlation, the, the kind of degree of how close I'm matching the index, the, the kind of hypothetical large hedge I'm trying to match, I know that would go down considerably. Now, the expected return in the back test may or may not change. In fact, it may even go up because I may have, by luck, just picked some markets that have done really well. Um, and in fact, in my book, this is one an explicit experiment that I run. I say, well, if I just trade a lot fewer markets, I do re I do much better than with the dynamic optimization. But that doesn't mean the dynamic optimization is poor. It just means I happen to have picked at random markets that have done really well. One example would be, say, euro dollar futures, um, which have you know a great back tested sharp ratio, but also a relatively small amount of capital required to trade them because they're quite low vol. Um, so that you know my process for choosing markets always picks those and that boosts the back tested chart ratio but of course that doesn't mean that i'm that i should definitely have euro dollars in my in my portfolio so so yeah i mean 
I, I feel a bit bad because I'm not here to defend himself. I'll say one really good thing about this fund. It's really cheap. I think it's 85 basis points management fee, which is really competitive. So, um, so that that's definitely a, definitely a good thing. And um, I'll be honest with you. You know, if I I can't I don't know what the minimum investment for this thing is, but but if I had say you know two thousand pounds and that was all I could put into into trend following, this would be right up there in terms of what I would do with that money because that's nowhere near enough to run my own strategy. Um, you know that uh, that's nowhere near enough um, to tr to invest in multiple managers or anything like that. So this this is a product. It's definitely a, a good niche, but I think the main and I'm sure Andrew himself wouldn't say this. It's definitely not a replacement for having, you know, a full a full fledged fund. I think I think there are, you know, in expectation. I think it wouldn't do as well because of this limitation we described. By the way, you left one option out in terms of uh, replication. That is, of course, you can replicate the replicator because they have to publish their positions every day. So you just be one day out. So yeah. it probably makes no difference. Yeah, that's true. But um, I know Andrew, funnily enough, is not a big fan of being replicated, even though he does like replicating other people. Anyways, um, I'm sure he'll be back to defend that comment. But there we are. Now, we need to go to the next point because that is also something we've been discussing. Uh, actually, I discussed it to, a little bit with Alan last week. So I, uh, you know, and you've written a, a long blog post about it. Maybe not specifically the same in the same vein, but but let's just uh, go through it. Um, and that is, of course, about how do I decide what to, how much to allocate to trend following? Um, so I'm going to give you the floor on that. Yeah, so uh, I like the way you described it as a long blog post. My blog posts are always long, and this is actually one of the shorter ones. <laughs> okay, fair enough. It looked long to me when I was yeah, trying to yeah, prepare yeah, for I'm this sure, conversation. Sure. Um, so you can look at this blog post in two ways. You can look at it as me answering this perennial question, how much money should I have in trend following? Or you can look at it as a, a kind of exercise explaining to people some of the the problems with and the right way to do portfolio optimizations in general okay so i'll keep it in the context of trend following because that's what people are interested in um, but but really it was a way of me illustrating some issues and techniques i use to deal with portfolio optimization so the basic idea behind this is you say well how much money do i want to put into and let's keep it simple as for the reasons we discussed way back at the start of the podcast into say 60 40 and then some trend following strategy. And I make it really, really simple. I, I literally consider just um, two, two assets, um, the US tenure and the um, S&P 500. As, and so that's my 60-40 portfolio. And then I trend follow those. So I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying it down to the absolute minimum, really, you can get away with. Um, and so an important thing to say is that, for example, the, this, this, te this technique will probably net-net give you a lower answer for what you should put in trend following because it's not including, for example, all the diversification you get from all those other asset classes that, that we can have when we're trading a full suite of futures, as we've discussed at length already. Um, so, so what I do is sort of say, well, what are the basic problems with the idea of doing this thing where we look back, we take a certain amount of history of returns, and then we decide based on that how much money we should put in trend following, how much money we should put into 6040. The first problem is if you look at your data set, so my, my data set for these two assets goes back to 1982. From 82 till quite recently, 6040 did incredibly well because, and the, the, you know, and if you dig into that, both stocks and bonds have gone up. And why have they gone up? Well, actually, it's because we had this secular period when inflation was falling, interest rates were falling, and as a result, equity equities were being re-rated as well. So the first thing I do is say, well, I don't think it, it's reasonable to use this historic period kind of without any sort of adjustment or consideration for the fact that we've had these secular trends. So the first thing I do is I actually take the, the price series and I actually adjust them to account for these secular trends. So what I do is say, well, okay, let's take equities. The PE ratio in September 82 and the S&P 500 was about nine, and now it's about 20. At least it was when I did this analysis. It may have changed a, a point or so by then. Um, and if you actually do the maths, that works out to an average annual return of 2% a year in equities coming from this re-rating effect. And if I do a similar thing with US 10-year, um, I get a lower number. I get 1.2% a year. But actually, because they're less volatile, that's actually a more significant component of the returns. 
Um, so what that actually does, for example, for US 10-year is it reduces the the kind of average return that, that you see um, by ooh, about, about a third, say. So you still do well until quite recently, but you don't do as well as, as, as you would do without this adjustment process. Um, so that's the first thing I do. The second thing I do is, is say, well, any of these optimizations are, you know, relying on this this data that's that's effectively uncertain and has uncertainties within it, and the optimization itself isn't very robust as well. So I, I use some techniques that I'm not going to go into now because it would take way too long to explain. Uh, people who are interested in the technical details can, can go on my blog and just 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 have a look. Um, and what I show is that um, that basically, although there is a kind of theoretical optimum that you should have. Um, the more interesting thing to think about is the, the degree of uncertainty in that. And if I do that, what I actually find is that um, the absolute maximum you should have in a 60-40 portfolio is, is about 45%. <laughs> so that's, in this particular setup, it comes out saying, well, trend following should be at least 55%. Um, and, the, the, you know, so, so that, that's obviously quite, quite a big number. Um, and I don't, but I then I then explain you know where that comes from and so on and so forth. Um, so you know there's this, this, this technical stuff there. But the perhaps the more interesting thing is that, and you would probably expect this to happen, um, the amount of money that goes into trend falling versus sixty forty increases when I apply the demeaning. So if I say if I take away these secular trends that have flattered sixty forty, but have also flattered trend following, particularly in bonds also in equities to degree because obviously if you've got these you know this this secular trend then that's going to for your very slow trend following models that's going to give you some extra return um but but obviously it's it's you know if the market's not gone by up as much and probably in the future we should expect that we shouldn't expect this this re-rating to continue it just can't and obviously it's recently broken then then you know it's so it's a nice way of saying well trend falling was good in the past if we don't expect you know equities to have this and bonds to have this sort of drift effect behind them that they've had for the last 40 years um, then you should put even more money into trend following which is intuitively what you'd expect but it's a nice kind of way of demonstrating it there so i think rich did a slightly different study he just used to beat uh, the the uh, stock chain trend index uh, on a 60 40 portfolio etc etc and he and he came up with the optimal allocation to to the trend index being 64% <laughs> interestingly enough so we kind of uh, reversed the uh, 60 40 to uh, you know 40 60 but where the 60 was trend and not um, not bonds but there we are all right well let's move on because i know we have a hard stop today so um last year we we did a a two-part episode over Christmas and New Year, where we we had all the kind of co-hosts together at once, and uh, that's going to happen again this year. Um, hopefully, we will be able to get a date sorted. Um, so that's something to look forward to. Um, Niels, do you want to give us the lineup of, of the luminaries that are going to be on this episode? Of course, you and I, obviously. Yeah, who else? it's the is the usual suspects. So it'll be you and I. We'll have Jim. We'll have Rich. We'll have uh, Mark. Um, and um, and so it'll be super fun. Um, and um, and Alan, of course, yeah. we'll have Alan. I was just thinking there's one missing here. How can um, we but I think Alan? more importantly, yeah, exactly. But but more importantly, I think what we're going to try and do is try and find themes, each of us, that we think kind of defines the year of 2022 and discuss them. But that doesn't mean that we won't be open to some really good suggestions, right? So if anyone out there today think that there might be a great topic that kind of encapsulates an issue of 2022 or not an issue but a, a theme of 2022 why don't you send them in um, usual email address and we will um, prioritize um, the best ones and see if we can fit them in from rob and me thanks so much for listening we look forward to being back with you next week and in the meantime take care of yourself and take care of each other Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. 
And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.